Folks, big shifts lie ahead of us, both in the near future and through the decade. Your ability to anticipate these shifts and to adapt will determine your future. To what extent will life be different? In this webinar, Arthur will draw on extensive research from worldwide works and interviews with global technology leaders to paint a picture of tomorrow. So welcome, Arthur. Thank you, Paul. And my first question, are we doomed? <laughs> We're doomed if we don't learn from the past. And that might sound like a contradiction in terms because you would think that this is so unprecedented, you cannot learn from the past. But many aspects of what is happening now are not um, unprecedented. The world has gone through massive crises that have changed the way that we've had to think, work, operate, etc. And if you consider uh, what has happened in the lifetime of our parents, for example. So I was talking about our parents and what they went through in their lifetimes. Think of the Second World War, where life came to a halt for six years. And then for many years after that, it was a case of uh, rebuilding. It's not a, quite a war at the moment, but in many ways it mimics or reflects the experience people had in wartime where their lives had to come to a halt. And if they lived in a war zone, you can imagine it was pure catastrophe. Those living in South Africa, uh, life carried on, but not life as usual because families were torn apart, uh, loved ones were going off to war and the like. My father fought in the Second World War. So I've heard many of those stories. It's not a distant historic artifact. It's something that actually lives on in this generation. And then you fast forward to uh, the um, 1970s when you had the oil crisis, the first oil crisis, and that was uh, the, the beginning of the world economy being turned upside down by this thing called oil. And then through to uh, the early 2000s with 9-11, uh, that, of course, turned America topsy-turvy, but the knock-on effect was felt globally, and travel was never the same again after that. Then we had the global financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. Uh, many thousands of organizations went out of business. And that is what people tend to compare the pandemic to, the 2008-2009 uh, crisis, because it had such a dramatic impact on the economy. But we need to look at all of those historic crises to understand what we have to um, do to address what is coming in the future. And what is coming is going to be as significant as what we've gone through in the last three months. It's not something that's going to play itself out in a few weeks' time. We're going to feel the effects of this for the next few years. But now, to me, what's quite interesting is that had this kind of pandemic, pandem, pandemic, let me try again, happened 20 or 30 years ago when we didn't have the advanced technology that we had today, the consequences of getting the message across quickly enough would have been quite different, surely? There's no question about it. But uh, if you think back to um, 2001, to, to the 9-11 scenario, we all were aware of what was happening as it was happening. I remember being at a conference in Grahamstown, and ironically, it was a conference on new media. And during a break, there was a, an SABC stand outside. And the SABC stand, of course, had the news going from different um, sources, including CNN. And we all watched the first tower um, with smoke pouring out of it and everyone speculating about a plane that had crashed into it. And even then, it was obvious that something serious had happened. When the second plane went in, many of us were watching it live on uh, TV. And uh, that was so immediate, thanks to international TV news having gone 24 hours. So already, before the, the internet came along, we had 24-hour news that kept us as uh, rapidly informed of uh, breaking news almost as rapidly as via the internet. And in a way, we were better informed then because that news was curated, whereas today we're pulling it from every side that we can and we're never sure which news sources are reliable, um, etc. 
So in, in many ways, we're not necessarily better off than we were uh, 20 years ago. If you look uh, back uh, 30 years, perhaps you could argue that. If you look back to the Second World War, certainly uh, it took often weeks for news to come through of, of what had happened in a particular battle or whether a loved one was safe or not. And it could even take months for uh, that to happen. So from that point of view, yes. But in terms of the crises of the last uh, 20 years or so, we're not necessarily better off. Um, we're in fact fighting a crisis of um, lack of trust in information as much as we um, are inundated with the latest information. Well, I, I remember um, watching, and this was almost 30 years ago, the, the first Iraqi war from my living room. And um, that was as far back as the, the early 90s. But it leads me um, to ask you, who will survive the economic crisis that is now already a given? We've seen some fascinating trends emerge in terms of who is coping best for now and who is really uh, running with the tools and the, the techniques that will enable them to survive. So um, one of my favorite examples, and I wrote about this in my column a couple of weeks ago, is a company called First Technology that mm -hmm literally overnight uh, find themselves supplying numerous other companies who are trying to set their staff up to work from home, trying to set up their cloud computing services, etc. They were ready for it because they were already operating fully in the cloud and they already were able to overnight switch their staff over to working remotely as opposed to working from the office. And their marketing was also uh, fully digital. So on several levels, they were ready for the crisis. But what made them ready? That's the question. And it's not unique to that particular company. What made them ready was the fact that they had undergone what's called digital transformation. And um, I've often commented that digital transformation was a buzzword before COVID-19, and now it's an imperative. So what it means is all your processes become digital, not just digitizing paper, People confuse digitizing with digitalization. And uh, I know that they are interchangeable, but there is a subtle difference. Digitization means that you've changed paper into digital format. Um, you've taken manual formats and made them digital. But digit digitalization, and this is digital transformation, is the uh, process becoming digital. And when I say the process, I mean every single process in the business. It means that you can connect any process to any other process and you can connect any information to any other information. Distinct from digitization, which if you think of uh, companies that will scan your uh, documents, but mm. even the scanned documents remain in a way dead uh, documents that now sit on a computer instead of in mm. a filing cabinet. They still can't be searched. They can't be linked to anything else. You can't click on them. In digitalization, any document is fully digital, clickable, linkable, searchable. Uh, that's one of the differences. But then your processes, your business processes, also are completely uh, digital. And that's what enables you to, uh, in an hour, send your staff home and have them log on from home and work from home, as opposed to having to work out what you're going to put online, what won't. Uh, be available online, who has what permissions to do what online. That's already all set up if you've undergone digital transformation. So that's the, uh, the background to it. The one number is that the proportion of companies that were digitally transformed before COVID-19 was 37%. The proportion of companies that are going to allow staff to carry on working remotely after COVID-19 is 38%. So you could almost say that those companies that are digitally transformed were not just ready when COVID-19 came along, but they are prepared to continue operating in this mode because they were set up for it all along and it, make, it just makes sense. But now that their staff has been forced to work this way, they don't have to persuade people that this works. We now know it works if you digitally transform. So for those that weren't ready for it, and are hoping for things to go back to where they were, the question is, has the world really changed forever? And if so, how? The world has definitely changed forever, but it's a nuanced change. 
and it hasn't changed the same way for everyone. You know, there's a, an idea that I've been uh, trying to argue for the last few years, which is that the future depends on what you can afford. So not everyone will experience the future in the same way. People who can afford to have broadband are going to have a different future to those who can't even afford data for their cell phone. So for, for you and I, for example, part of our future of entertainment is watching the latest movies from home um, as they're released. So the premiere of a new blockbuster isn't going to be in physical cinemas in the future. It's going to be via Netflix or Showmax or one of those, Amazon Prime, whichever one you uh, want to join or whichever one gets the rights to host a premiere for a, a particular movie. And that makes sense. It's obvious. It's already in a way what you're experiencing with mm -hmm. um, watching movies from home instead of going to a movie house. But for someone who can't afford broadband and who can't afford a monthly subscription to Netflix, that's an alien uh, concept. That's certainly mm -hmm. not part of uh, that particular future. So once you have that context that everyone has a different future based on what they can afford, mm -hmm. then you start looking at what changes have been happening in uh, the uh, pandemic or in the time of pandemic, let's say, since the middle of March. In fact, early March when people were first being sent home and you saw what was uh, beginning to change. So one of the big shifts that we experience in South Africa, but it's also global, is in online retail. And this is probably one of the best, you might call it the canary in the coal mine, you know, when uh, coal mine used to use canaries to detect if gas was coming. So it was an early warning system. So online retail is the canary in the COVID-19 coal mine, so to speak. And what it has shown us is a high proportion of people who were able to shop online, but it didn't suit them. They were threatened by it, or it seemed too complicated, or they didn't trust it, etc. A high proportion of those people uh, started shopping online regularly, especially when it came to groceries. So grocery shopping became a standard uh, way of shopping for a high proportion of people. And there's a, a fascinating percentage there that Nielsen came up with. Uh, Nielsen did a survey in South Africa on how many people were shopping online regularly at the end of April. And guess what that percentage was? 37%. So Say the same proportion, 37%. 37%, wow. So the same proportion of companies that were digitally transformed hmm. is the proportion of uh, consumers shopping online regularly. And that's pure coincidence. Hmm. But it's, uh, what it does point to is the high proportion of businesses and consumers, and equi an equally high proportion are ready to embrace the digital world. But now having embraced the digital world, it doesn't mean that they will continue embracing it. For a lot of them, they hate shopping this way. A lot of people were desperate to get back into the malls and into uh, the grocery stores. I don't understand why you would want to go back to a mall, but for a lot of people, it's, it's, uh, it's like the watering hole. It's their uh, mm -hmm. social environment, the shopping center or the grocery store for that matter. So a lot of people will go back to the old way of doing things, but even those who've gone back to it, once they've tasted online shopping and it's worked for them, they will now be ready for specific items or specific kinds of shopping to uh, do it online. Those who uh, were doing it regularly and really enjoyed it and find it changed their lives because it saved them so much time, it was so much more convenient um, as well to have their shopping delivered uh, to their front door, they will now become regular shoppers. Mm -hmm. So to be conservative almost, let's say a third of that 37% now becomes regular shoppers. That's something like 12 and a half percent. That already is significantly more than what currently shop regularly online. And then- but now Arthur, you've got the, you've still got the problem here that um, let's call it two thirds. Let's call it the balance of the 37%. They don't have access to broadband. So it's a lot more difficult for them. Now, sure, they can, they can <clears throat> shop using their smartphones and what have you, but every time they get online, it's costing them a small fortune. So my question to you is, Correct. don't you think that the, just the mere condition of the marketplace and the way things have changed, don't you think that that will cr 
create pressure to drive down broadband, at least drive down data prices and ultimately make it a lot more accessible to a lot more people. There's no question about it. So let's move on, on to the sector that is most directly relevant to what you just said. So online retail, as I said, is the canary in the coal mine. It tells you something about the proportion of people that have become digitalized, so to speak, being able to operate in the digital economy. So that's more than a third of uh, adult South Africans suddenly are able to operate in that economy. A, a lot will go back to the old way of doing things. But now we move to education and we see a whole different story in the education sector. There, a high proportion of South Africans, particularly in the middle class and those who can afford it, were able to move to remote learning. Even there, however, it was a case of haves and have nots within the province of the privileged. So most private schools and many uh, better off government schools moved to remote learning initially um, in the early phases of lockdown. It took many of them a few weeks and some a couple of months to set themselves up to get their students ready, to get their staff trained, etc. cetera. Um, so when the end of lockdown for schools arrived, most of those schools still had to have a blend between physical and online uh, learning. So those schools are now part of the new normal, what I prefer to call the new abnormal. And those schools um, are now operating in this world where online learning is part of the way they uh, operate. It's, it hasn't replaced physical learning. As soon as they could, they went back to physical learning. But online is part of it. But then you have the numerous schools where the very concept of online learning was simply impossible. And this highlighted the real digital divide in South Africa, those that could go digital and those that couldn't. So in the same way that a third of companies could go digital overnight and a third of consumers could go digital uh, overnight, you've got the two thirds who are stuck on the other side of that divide. Now for most companies, it's a decision that they're going to make to uh, go digital. For consumers, they don't have the luxury of making that uh, decision. So this suddenly places a massive um, responsibility on government to change the scenario. And it's got to be changed in numerous ways. The problem is government has always paid lip service to enabling the population from yeah. a digital point of view. We had at the end of 2018, the president stating that it was a high priority to create an enabling environment to bring down the cost of connectivity and bring everyone into this digital economy, or words to that effect. But we're now sitting in the middle of uh, 2020, and we still aren't close to that ideal. We're still in a situation where the only spectrum that's been issued for high-speed connectivity has been on an emergency basis because of the pandemic. The very fact that they've issued it shows that they are capable of uh, issuing it. But we're still waiting for an auction for the spectrum that the operators need in order to provide connectivity. So what we have instead over the last um, year or two is that operators have been repurposing existing spectrum that wasn't intended for high speed wireless broadband, but they do what they call refarming. Refarming means that they're adapting the equipment to be able to run on that same spectrum, but at much higher speeds. And that's where we get 4G operating on spectrum that was supposed to be for, for 3G connectivity. Now here's the shocking fact. We haven't had new spectrum issued in South Africa across all operators since 2005. The emergency spectrum that was issued now is the first spectrum in 15 years that's been allocated to all operators. Now that is criminal. That is uh, reflecting such absolute incompetence in government and in the Department of Communication that it leaves us with little hope that the issue can be solved. We've had 10 ministers of communication since 2008, since they first announced digital TV um, migration. We've had 10 ministers of communication. We still haven't completed digital migration. And with digital migration, you have what they call the digital dividend, which 
means that the spectrum that was being used inefficiently for analog TV could now be used for high speed um, internet access. That's still not available. Yeah. Is it a combination of lack of political priority and um, constraints due to the capability of the undersea cables? Or what's to blame for this situation, which probably should have been resolved some time ago? There are no physical constraints at all. We've got so much undersea cable connectivity coming to this country now that it's not going to be possible to use it all up in the next few years. Wow. Um, the real issue is lack of political will and lack of political priority. And uh, there, it also requires that we have effective and efficient ministers in charge, but also that the cabinet gives us true priority and not just says that it's a priority. And that's been the problem. Uh, government has paid lip service to this issue. They've paid lip service to the idea that this is a priority. So every time they say it's a priority, we think, yay, we're going to get to our high-speed broadband now. And then we wait another um, year before they announce a new process, for example, or a new study, or uh, they have to research uh, market demand, etc. cetera. There have been all those kinds of excuses. The time for excuses has run out. It's a time for true action. And this is where the Minister of Communication really has to prove herself. She disgraced herself during the um, early stages of the uh, lockdown uh, when she went lunching with friends and she was suspended for two months. Now she's back. She's got mm -hmm. a chance to show that she has what it takes, that she deserves to be in that uh, position. And both she and the uh, president uh, need to tell South Africans what we're going to do next in terms of resolving this issue, because it's not just about operators getting um, 5G spectrum or rolling out 5G. And it's not just about you and I getting faster wireless uh, connectivity. It really is about enabling the entire population to be part of this digital revolution. And uh, if I feel, if, if I sound like I'm angry about it, it's, it's because I am. I'm quite yeah. livid that we have been having the same argument for more than five years now. So essentially, instead of focusing on how much people drink or smoke uh, and, and, and whether or not they go to the shops without a permit or not, the real focus should be on the enablement of people digitally so that they can carry on some kind of business and that entrepreneurship is therefore encouraged because there's no doubt in yours and my mind that we have plenty of entrepreneurs out there who are ready to try stuff but, but are constrained by the high cost of, of, of getting online. There's no question about that. I wouldn't say instead of, but um, at the same time as focusing on those kinds of issues, uh, yeah. there needs to be a very strong focus on how do we address this fact that such a large proportion of the population wasn't able to adapt overnight. The reason they weren't able to adapt is that they couldn't afford access, um, either because they couldn't afford data or because they didn't have the devices that would give them that uh, access. And in one of my uh, columns, also in the Sunday Times recently, I wrote that this pandemic has proven on the basis of the educational divide that we've now seen, that internet access is really a human right. Previously, that claim could have been dismissed as being fanciful, but sure. the crisis has actually proven that internet access has to be a human right in order to give everyone equal access to the means of education and work. So, so given where we are now with these constraints in, in place, there's really two things I want to ask you now. And the first one is, how long do you realistically think it's going to take for a response from government to get us um, onto a better trajectory from a point of view of the, um, the, the bandwidth and the accessibility? And then the second part is, if you had to take your crystal ball and look into it and project where we're going to be in the next six, 12, 18 months. What do you think is going to happen? I do agree with government in that uh, the reason for the lockdown wasn't to stop the pandemic, but rather to give it time to prepare sure. for what's coming. 
So we can expect to see the um, COVID-19 cri uh, crisis in terms of infections escalate over yeah. the next few months. Some, some speculate that the peak will come at the end of July as we hit the heart of our winter. Others say by September as it spreads amongst more of the population. Whichever the case might be, it's going to have a massive impact on, on the population. We're going to see uh, people in voluntary lockdown for still at least uh, the next three months or so. And if it really does get that bad in September, then that's going to carry on till at least the end of the year. That means that in preparing for 2021, schools are going to have to have the option of teachers operating from home, learners uh, learning from home on the one hand. On the other hand, um, companies are going to have to go back into some form of lockdown as well, or at least remote working. So those who are at risk in any way will need to work from home, for example. And that's going to uh, take us into most of 2021. The, the current projections are that we're not going to have a vaccine for at least 12 months and possibly uh, more than 18 months. And that is on a fast track for the vaccine. And the vaccine is really the key to unlocking all economies and everyone going back to normal. So we're seeing a 12 to 18 month massive fallout from this uh, pandemic. Now, again, back to Nielsen, they did some fascinating scenario planning on what we can expect to see happening uh, during this period and as a result of uh, this crisis. So already, um, almost all economies globally are going into recession. Look at the impact of recession to start with. Recession results in businesses closing down and people losing their jobs. The moment people are losing their jobs in large numbers, it means that there's less disposable income, there's less to spend on services, and there's uh, fewer people who are able to be customers of large organizations and small organizations for that matter. That means organizations of every size are going to suffer. Any organization that depends on consumer spending is going to suffer as a result of uh, this recession. So that's aside from the impact of people falling ill and not being able to work or working remotely. We're going to have far lower demand for products and services. And that means we're going to see profits plummet. We're going to see numerous organizations running at a loss, those that are able to keep operating. And that will have a, a domino effect where even more businesses will uh, close down. People will lose their homes. We're going to see a tremendous level of tragedy over the next 12 months. That's all the downside, um, mm. of course. There are upsides. And we will see, I think, a tremendous amount of entrepreneurialism going on. People will find the entrepreneur inside themselves. People will take advantage, those who have the means and who have the access will take advantage of the digital world to reinvent themselves. In many cases, because they have no choice, it's a bit like the coming back to the online retail scenario at the moment. A lot of people started buying groceries online because they had no choice on the one hand, but they also had the means to do it online on the other. And we're going to see exactly the same thing happening in the working environment. People are going to find new ways of working, new kinds of businesses to start because they don't have a choice in the matter and they will have the means to go online in many cases. Of course, some people won't have that access anymore either, but that is going to be a, a very powerful trend driving innovation and uh, driving entrepreneurship in South Africa as well as globally. The astonishing thing about this crisis is that the kind of trends that we are seeing in this country are global trends. It's not only a South African scenario. Sure, sure. So we, we, we have a comment here from Paul who comes to us from the Netherlands and he says in Italy and Netherlands virologists from several universities see that the virus is getting less aggressive and that a second wave will be less hard as the first wave. Um, your comment on that, what then? I, uh, I can only say that I'm not a virologist or an epidemiologist, and that there's a tremendous amount of arguing about those kind of issues. People tend to cherry pick the 
predictions and the analysis that uh, works for them. If you look at the sheer numbers, and that I can work with because I, I do work in statistics and I can't comment on the numbers. If you look at the sheer numbers, the uh, rate of infection is, or the number of infections is rising at the moment. So I, don't, I certainly don't see this way being uh, less aggressive. Uh, the number of people dying is increasing. When you look at countries where they're ignoring the, uh, the requirements of the crisis, like Brazil, you can see the human tragedy playing itself out there because of uh, believing that it's not as serious as people say. So anyone who says it's not so serious, um, I don't listen to, uh, to, to start with. But secondly, I don't prognosticate on the, on the virus itself or on the process, progress of the um, epidemic, but I can comment on the fallout from it and certainly the economic uh, fallout and how it plays itself out in the digital world. So, so in a sense, you've really got, firstly, the way that the various governments have been approaching it in terms of uh, denialism or taking it seriously, um, but then you, you also have the situation of, of, of diet, of access to medical care, of um, just generally the way people are looking after themselves. And clearly there are certain populations that are more susceptible to getting very ill from the virus than others. We've seen the situation in the United States where, for example, the uh, black population is far more severely affected, uh, both in terms of uh, proportional infections, but also the uh, ability to recover from the, from the disease. But it's very clear that that is a socioeconomic issue. And it's mm. a question of access to uh, medical treatment. Sure. It's a question of uh, being healthy in the first place because of having adequate nutrition. All of those kind of socioeconomic issues certainly do have a massive uh, impact. Uh, but one has to look at those factors behind statistics of that kind and how different populations are um, affected. One cannot say, one cannot point to genetics as the factor when there are so many social uh, issues uh, behind Absolutely. it. Absolutely. So then, um, g given the scenario that we, we're in at the moment, there, there's a saying that says that necessity is the mother of invention. So what do you feel that will be the radical new technologies that will come about in response to what's happening now? This is a far happier topic for me because <laughs> I love to look at what is going to come um, in the future in terms of what will make uh, people's lives easier and also extrapolating from the technologies we have um, at the moment. So there, there are quite a few that I find very exciting, some that are obvious and some that are very fancy, fanciful. And to get the fanciful out of the way first, and probably the, the scariest uh, one of all, is telepathy. Now, I'm not saying that we're going to transmit thoughts to each other's brains, but the, the most astonishing technology that has been uh, developed over the past uh, decade or two, and still in its very early stages, is, is the ability to convert thoughts into, into action uh, through a, a, a brain-computer interface. And this isn't about having electrodes planted inside your brain, but rather having something that can measure your brain waves and your ability to focus those brain waves, but also the technology emerging that enables you to focus those brain waves. So about two years ago, I went to an event called uh, Cisco Live in Barcelona where one of their predictions was that by 2028, we would have uh, brain to text interfaces. You would be able to plug something onto your head to be able to pick up your brain waves and it would be able to read the words that you were forming in your brain and uh, put those into a text message that could then be transmitted to someone else. So you could think your thoughts at somebody and they would receive it in a WhatsApp or whatever is the most popular instant messaging tool by 2028. So the first thought is, how scary, what if, what if you're drunk? This uh, drunk uh, texting uh, is, is a, a, a small uh, catastrophe today compared to what drunk thinking might be in eight years time. A lot of people have said it's too fanciful, um, it's pure science fiction, it's not possible. 
But I think back to when I used to review games for uh, PC Review, which was the first consumer technology supplement in a newspaper in South Africa. It was in the Mail and Guardian in those days. It was called the Weekly Mail back then. But mm. I remember one of my most startling reviews that I ever wrote for them was when I was sent a game to try out where you would control a character skiing down a slope and uh, maneuvering through the flags and uh, through the trees, etc but only using brain waves. So the game would be loaded onto the computer and you would plug your computer into these um, headphones that were not over your ears, but over your um, temples and it would pick up your brain waves and you would have to concentrate and focus your brain waves to try and move this character between the flags and trees. And it actually worked. It took a lot of focus. I imagine if I had it for uh, a few months instead of a couple of weeks and was able to really train it that I, I could start focusing far better and actually complete the course which I was never able to in the couple of weeks that I played with it but in that time it uh, showed me the potential um, for a consumer to be able to access technology that allows them to convert their brain waves into actions on a computer so given that that was in the early 2000s, in fact, it's probably the late 1990s now that I think about it, um, and the technology was at that point. You can imagine in the scientific world and the medical world, they've taken that technology a lot further. And it's mostly for uh, medical purposes and for people who are paralyzed, for example, to be able to control uh, prosthetic um, arms wow. or uh, prosthetic yeah. limbs. It's mainly in that environment where the research is uh, going on, but it's also happening in the arena of connecting brainwaves to um, everyday consumer devices. So it's not far-fetched. That to me is um, an incredibly fanciful, but exciting and scary technology. And one of the real concerns with that, of course, is what happens to privacy if someone hacks into your brainwaves. Was that, do you have any other examples of how these extraordinary yeah. new technologies can be applied to the benefit of the population and particularly those that are, are not as advantaged as people that have fiber in their homes? Well, there's two sides to it. Um, uh, the, the first is that for those who don't have advanced technology or can't afford uh, data, there really is an obligation on government to bring down the cost of data and make it more widely available as well. Not just bring down the cost of data. If you talk about internet access being a human right, then there is in fact an obligation on the operators to provide a minimum allowance of data for every citizen. Sure, and free. Well, my suggestion is that they shouldn't auction off the spectrum. They should allocate the spectrum and in return, every citizen gets a free amount of data. Let's say it's 100 megs a day. Now you and I can't operate on 100 megs um, a day. This conversation is going to use uh, 100 megs. But for someone who is only using a cell phone for uh, using basic apps or for instant messaging or job hunting or schoolwork, for example, 100 megs a day would be adequate. I've seen um, an announcement somewhere, I think Cell C announced that they would be giving 50 uh, kilobits, uh, kilobytes per day. Now that's laughable because that's not even a web page uh, being opened up or 500 kilobytes per day. But if you, if you look at 100 megs um, a day, suddenly you can do something with that. Suddenly that makes the internet accessible to all. So that's, that's what I believe is a, an obvious solution. Government wants to make money from Spectrum, obviously, but rather make the money from the taxes that the mobile operators are going to uh, generate. Let the Spectrum be a, a national resource that is put to the benefit of the entire population. Sure. That's on the one side. On the other side, my, what I believe is the most exciting technology of the, of, um, the next decade is something that's already in widespread usage, and it's called robotic process automation. And that is the technology that's behind the software bots that you're already seeing becoming pervasive. 
a lot of organizations use bots, for example, um, in WhatsApp or um, in other instant messaging tools where you query what seems like a, a company representative and you quickly realize you're actually talking to the software. But the software is intelligent enough to be able to work out what you're asking and to deliver answers to you. The most basic form of that is where you have a simple uh, WhatsApp menu, the WhatsApp equivalent of a USSD. USSD being the short codes that you uh, get on basic uh, phones. In, smart, in, in WhatsApp, for example, if you're an MTN customer, you just type in through the MTN WhatsApp account menu and up comes a menu of five options. And option one will be your account balance. You just type in one and up comes a detailed account balance. Now, that sounds fairly straightforward and obvious, but given where we were five years ago, it's quite revolutionary to be able to get all that information just with uh, two or three um, little instructions in WhatsApp. To me, that is uh, very powerful. But now you take that a step further and you build intelligence into these um, menu structures. And that's where you start seeing the software bot come um, into action. And some of the, the bots are really appalling. If you look at the discovery bot, for example, if you're a user of Vitality and you try to use their bot on the Vitality app, it's disastrous. Anything you ask that, that's not absolutely a standard question will default you back to the main menu. So you might as well use their website. So if the website is more effective than the bot, then don't use the bot. But cool. I do believe that RPA, robotic process automation, is going to advance rapidly in the next few years. And one of the things that I expect is that in the near future, let's call it the medium term future to be a little uh, conservative, the bot is actually going to replace the app because if you can just tell a bot to do things for you, right now you can only ask them to do things, but in the future you'll tell them to do things. And if they can do things that previously you had to go to an app and work out what to click where to, in order to do that, then you would rather do that. You would rather tell the device. And when you can tell the device what to do and you don't have to see what it's doing, you're not actually going to need a device that we uh, have at the moment called a smartphone or a handset. So that has the further extrapolated idea then that by the end of this decade, the handset probably won't be necessary. The functionality of the phone will all be voice driven and it can be packed into something as simple as a ring on your finger or an earphone. Probably the earphone is the most practical because we're already getting used to the idea of having a Bluetooth earphone through which we listen yeah. to music on our phones or where we have our conversations. And because mm. the earphone has um, a, what they call bone conductivity built into it, it picks up what's coming out of your mouth, it transmits that into the earphone, and you can talk even though you don't have a microphone at your um, mouth. It's built into the um, earphone. So the earphone could be the smartphone of the future. As I said, it could be the ring, it could be your Sunglasses, you could be wearing smart glasses that look a little more stylish than those Google glasses did a few years ago. And that's got far more intelligence built into it. And it's not um, obvious that you are looking at people and identifying them by quickly running their face through a database that's somewhere online. With Google Glass, it was obvious you're doing that. So you got beaten up if you um, were invading people's privacy. With the smart glasses of the future, uh, chances are um, there's going to be some kind of limitations built into it to avoid you violating other people's uh, privacy. But the point of that is that you can build all of the phone functionality into those devices and you won't need a phone because you'll be controlling your world by a voice. And this is where the bot comes into its own. What we'll probably see in the future is that as opposed to companies having um, to develop a bot that can handle customer service on their website or through their app or through their WhatsApp account or whatever the case might be, every one of us will be able to rope in bots to do our personal uh, business for us. You need to have your driver's license renewed, instruct your, uh, your bot to have it done for you or your car license at least. Maybe driver's license is still going to want to 
um, run you through some tests. But for your car license to be renewed, which at the moment you've got to jump through hoops, and it's now being taken online, um, it, uh, right now, in fact, you should be able to renew your car license online as opposed to going into the post office or anywhere else. But in the future, you'll just tell your bot to renew it. And your bot will pull together all the information, all the documentation, and um, connect it to the right people and the right processes and come back and say, your driver's license is renewed. It will all be digital and you won't need to have a physical sticker placed on your car because all that the uh, traffic cop has to do is run your number plate uh, through uh, their app on their device, whatever that device might be, or tell a bot to check on this number and it will tell, tell them whether the person has renewed their license, for example. That's a, a very simple, straightforward example that I think is an obvious one. But it goes a bit further. I was actually uh, having a long conversation with my daughter the other day. She wants to become a lawyer. She wants to study law. She's um, finishing school at the moment. But um, we were talking about how will law change in the future? And one of the ideas that we came up with was that we know that already the article clock and the role of the article clock is going to change because in the past their main role was to search through legal precedents and case um, history etc in order to build the uh, background uh, for a case uh, that is changing because artificial intelligence is being used to do all of that automatically so what will the role of the article clock be um, in the future well, they probably going to have to, in the near future, have to set up bots that will do specific jobs uh, towards a particular case. Or if someone phones in and says they need to have this kind of documentation generated, the article clock will take uh, that particular requirement and instruct the bot uh, what has to be done. And the bot will do all the research, pull together all the documentation, contact the client, for additional documentation or information that is needed. And in the past, where a, a lawyer would have to work, um, let's say a senior lawyer would have, have to work at that case, it only finally comes to them for final approval. And they just peruse what the bot has done um, with the guidance of the uh, clock and they sign it off. So now the lawyer can spend a lot more time working on the nuances of a case rather than the background of a case. And then you take that a step further. This is now a further five years um, into the future, let's say. Um, every individual who needs a legal issue addressed is simply going to be able to spin up a bot um, for that specific purpose. They won't have to go to a lawyer. They'll get a law bot to do it for them until it gets to a point where something actually has to go to court and has to be brought in front of a judge. But your standard basic legal uh, issues can be dealt with by a bot. And then you extrapolate that to medicine. A bot is going to do your diagnosis and your prognosis, but it's uh, going to need a doctor, a human doctor to sign it off in the end to say this is correct or oops, the uh, bot missed this crucial point and it's going to kill you if you follow its, its advice. Or so, the bot was incorrectly programmed. Correct, correct. So in every profession, you're going to find that bots are going to transform the ability of the ordinary individual to get access to professional services. Wow. Arthur, this has been absolutely uh, fascinating. I was just thinking while you were speaking about the fact that uh, the iPod was such a revelation and as soon as the iPhone came into its own, and my recollection is that the iPhone, the first one was around about 2010. Um, 2006. What was it, 2006? 2007. Uh, 2007. Okay, so what then and happened was that the, the yeah. iPod became part, just a part of the iPhone. Yeah. Now we, we have the iPhone 11 coming out with, um, and probably before then with face recognition. So I think what you're predicting is, is, is highly viable. It really means in a sense that an article clerk uh, will become a bot programmer, really. Absolutely. My argument is that in almost any one of the professions, and when I talk about professions, I'm talking about those that you need an accredited qualification, like the doctor, lawyer, architect, um, etc. In every one of those professions, 
the person who has programming ability is going to have an edge over the person who simply studies the basic subject um, matter. And uh, arch architecture is a great example of that um, as well. But I think lawyers, doctors, and actuarial scientists, uh, for example, the actuary who also is able to program is going to have a massive edge over the actuary who simply knows how to crunch numbers. But on top of that, um, in all of those professions, the one who understands what you can do with a bot and is able to program a bot initially will also have an edge. But bear in mind that uh, all of this will uh, lead to a point where you'll be able to uh, go to a website or the equivalent of a website and say, I need a bot that can do this and it'll be spun up for you instantly. The same way today where you can get templates for websites you can get a WordPress template, for example, to create a, a very specific kind of a website overnight or in a couple of uh, hours. The exact same will apply to these bots. You'll be able to go to a platform, whatever that platform looks like, and off the platform, with using your, your voice instructions, you'll be able to download the bot that suits your purposes for a, a very specific period or for a long term uh, purpose, which whatever the requirement is. So bots will become a commodity and being able to develop a bot will no longer be an advantage. In the medium term, in the medium term it will be. In the long term, it will be the ability to use the bot in the most effective way possible and possibly the most competitive way possible. And these won't necessarily be areas of competitive differentiation. They'll rather be the ability to stay in the game. Uh, just a quick example where um, in the late 1990s, there were quite a few people, Bill Gates, Microsoft, Andy Grove at Intel, who were saying that in the future, every business will be an internet uh, business. Back then, it was a competitive differentiator to be an internet business. But today, if you're not an internet business, you really are almost out of business. The same will apply to the ability to um, use bots in the future.